Laverty is our uh, author in residence in Sword House. His uh, book, uh, Hands of the Tyrant, is uh, available. And he told me that uh, if there are any purchases of his book tonight, he will be donating all the proceeds to the Ray A. But his, uh, his involvement tonight will not be a reading from his book. He has uh, educated me tonight that spoken word is not a reading, it's a storytelling. Uh, the story that he's going to be telling is half, as I understand it, half true and half fabrication. Is that right? Sounds like a lot of resumes I've seen. <laughs> uh, but stories are, are very forgiving. So thank you very much, Mike, for participating tonight, and we look forward to the story. Thank you. Okay, so I will begin with a spoken word performance. This is actually 100% true. The next thing I'll do was going to be about 75% truth, and the last thing I do is 100% fabrication. So, in my mind, I was I thought it'd be an interesting transition. So, so I thought it'd be perfect to tell this story. It's about my one and only day on a film set, and I call this a grip for a day. My story begins in Winnipeg, Manitoba. My friend Rick worked his way into film very slowly. He started as an extra. He sent them an 8x10 image and they would call him and he'd be an extra in films. Now, Rick is a Métis man, but for some reason he was often cast as a Mexican thug, a <laughs> Latino thug in, in many movies. So, he, he's a very intimidating man. He's very big, he looks very angry, but he's one of the nicest guys I know. So he, he got cast in many movies as, as an extra. Worked his way up into film. He became what's known as a grip. Now, for those that don't know, a grip is basically a pack mule on the film set. They, they lug around massive pieces of equipment, as I would soon learn. Rick gives me a call at about 11.30 in the morning. Wakes me up from a deep sleep. When I was an undergraduate student, I would arrange my schedule so I wouldn't go to bed at least by 12, 1 o'clock. So 11.30 was pretty early for me. And so he calls me up and he says, Mike, do you want to be on the film set today? We're short people. Do you want to be on the film set? And I'm like, of course, but I've got to go to class. I've got to go to Canadian literature, which I loved. But I had to do it. So I skipped class, took a bus to downtown Winnipeg, and there I was on the film set. It was a pretty incredible experience. It was in a part of the city called the Exchange District. And this is a city, um, a part of Winnipeg, that was built to resemble New York City and Chicago in the 1920s, turn of the century. So they filmed many movies there to look like New York City. If you've watched movies that take place in Chicago and New York City, it's actually a really good chance. It's actually downtown Winnipeg. So there I am. I show up. They give you a really cool headset. So you, you get to hang out on Main Street in Winnipeg with a headset in your ear, just kind of standing there looking cool. And these women who had come up and talked to me, women that would never talk to me in any situation, who I would be extremely shy and embarrassed and would never talk to them, would come up and I'd have my headset on. I'd be like, kind of, kind of like this. Yeah, we're making a movie. Can't talk right now. And I, and I would, I would just make things up. Like, yeah, Roger, okay, yeah, I'll be there in ten seconds. And then that, so that was a lot of fun. But the, the crew knew I was a rookie, and I felt like I stood out like a sore thumb. And I thought I was playing along, I was kind of mixing and mingling. And then one of the gaffers, and it's one of the great things about film is these, these people have these great names like grips and gaffers. So one of the gaffers walks up and he goes, where the hell did this guy come from? Templand? And I just kind of <laughs> stared at my shoes and he kind of, and then five minutes later, me and that guy are, ho are hoisting this massive spotlight up to a building. And the science of film really fascinated me. They, when they film a scene, a daylight scene, 
they do it at around dusk or even at night, and they shine a spotlight into an apartment window to simulate sunlight. They don't use natural sunlight, they actually use a spotlight. So apparently that looks better on film, so that kind of... It was, it was really cool to see the science of film. So, so there I was doing that, and then about two hours later, we were, we were boarding up the windows of a bowling alley to reproduce night. So you wouldn't film at night, you would actually board up the window. So I was very fascinated with the, with the process of filmmaking, and that was during the calm moments. You notice the life of a grip, you just sit there and you wait, and then the director yells cut, and it's like being in a war zone. You've got a sergeant yelling at you, screaming at you to pick up equipment. They had these giant things called mambas, and a, and a mamba is actually a lighting rig. It's made of like solid titanium. It weighs like 500 pounds. And I had to hoist these things on my shoulder. I moved about 10 of those. And then they said, Mike, now we got to move the big mambas. And they have the little mamba and they've got like the big gigantic mamba and I couldn't lift any of those. So, so that was my life. That was the kind of fast paced movement of film. It was a pretty incredible experience. Now my friend Rick, told me during the downtimes, he's like, Mike, you gotta look busy. You can't just stand there. So he takes me to this crate, and in this crate is, is filters. And he takes one up, and he goes, Mike, I want you to look through this filter and tell me what you see. So I look through, and he goes, that's a sitcom. And I'm like, oh yeah, it is. And everything is a sitcom. He would pick the next filter up, and he'd be like, Mike, now you're in a horror movie. And it was like, you were in a horror movie. You know. Uh, shampoo commercial, uh, days of our lives, you name it, he could do that with a filter. And I was sort of just musing on the, how TV and films have just, you know, just framed my consciousness and my, my waking reality. As that happens, the star of the film, Ben Kingsley, walks out the back door and comes up behind me. This is my first and only celebrity encounter. We kind of nod at each other. He points to one of the cars in the parking lot and says, that's your car? And I go, nope, I drive the bus. <laughs> and, and he goes, but that's the Chrysler 300. It's a pretty nice car, isn't it? And I go, yep, sure is. <laughs> and he walks back inside, and that was it. I'm like, I just met Ben Kingsley. I just met Gandhi. So no, 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 he, he served Ben Kingsley. He's actually a knight. And so he... <laughs> And my friend Rick comes back, and I'm so excited, and I relay that story. I'm like, I just met him. I just met Ben Kingsley. And he said, you called him sir, right? You did call him sir, right? And I'm like, no, I did not call him sir. So apparently, you have to address him as sir. I didn't. Turns out it wasn't a big deal. But when he walked on the set, he walked in this flowing black robe. He's more Tibetan monk than knight. And he walks in, and he's a very important man. but. That was my only, my only mistake on the film set. They promised me I would be in the credits. They said it would be Grip, Mike Laverty. I would be in the credits as they rolled at the end of the movie. About seven months later, I watched that with my wife, waiting through this terrible, terrible movie. It was awful. <laughs> I, I, I wish it was a good movie, but it was terrible. The credits rolled. My name's not there. So it was a little bit of a disappointment, but my name was on the paycheck that they gave me for my one day as a grip. And I guess, you know, as a famous person said, it's not a crime if you don't get caught, and it's not a show if you don't get paid. And that was me being a grip for a day. Thank you.